Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality characteristics of the Michael Scott character from the television series, The Office. So I will be talking about different things that happen in that series. So there will be spoilers here in this video. Now, The Office is a television show that ran from 2005 to 2013, nine seasons. It featured a number of colorful characters, most notably Michael Scott, played by Steve Carell. Michael is the regional manager of the Scranton, Pennsylvania branch of a company named Dunder Mifflin, a company that distributes paper. The show was set up to seem like a camera crew was filming the employees of this particular branch, including times when the characters were speaking directly to the camera. There were themes in his behavior that I'll review, then I'll take a look at his personality, and then I'll give my diagnosis. Of course, Michael Scott is a fictional character, and I am diagnosing that fictional character, not the actor Steve Carell, who played Michael Scott. Now we see here, in terms of themes, an unusual mix of traits in Michael Scott. He has a marked lack of insight. He would likely not really be able to function well in the real world. His personality doesn't seem well suited to attaining career goals in the area of management. We see that there are references made to him being lonely as a child. He clearly seems somewhat simple, naive, and childlike. He always has a desire to have fun. And in terms of the loneliness, not only do we see this discussion that he might have been lonely as a child, I think this is a theme throughout the show as well. He said he wanted to get married and have a hundred kids, so he would have a hundred friends, and none of them would be able to say no to being his friend. We see that one time he goes home on Halloween and hands out candy by himself. Kind of a sad juxtaposition from his behavior at work, seeming so enthusiastic, to again being lonely at home. We see he gets a phone plan where he has unlimited minutes for five friends. He doesn't have five friends to add to the plan. In terms of other themes, we see that Michael makes inappropriate, awkward, and offensive comments. He has terrible boundaries and no filter. And he seems to want to be friends with his co-workers as opposed to colleagues. Again, really blurring the boundary between manager and worker. This is kind of a theme that comes up many times in the series. Michael believes that he is well-liked by his co-workers, even when some of them do not like him. Although, to some extent, many do like him, and that tends to increase as the series goes on, at least the part of the series that he's in. He has a prominent role in the first seven seasons. We see him in the very last episode of the series as well, in season nine. Now, he is the target of a lot of jokes by the co-workers, but he doesn't seem to understand that. He doesn't really understand their reactions. So he seems kind of highly resistant to criticism, but I think it's more of the lack of insight that plays a part. I don't think he really understands the criticism. Now, he needs to be the center of attention. We see that he's invited to be an usher at a wedding, and he believes that his role will be the high point of the ceremony. He calls unnecessary meetings to talk about himself, right? Not really business things. So a lot of examples here of how he's trying to draw attention to himself. Interestingly, we see that he does hate one of the employees, Toby from HR. And I think this is because as an HR worker, Toby represents appropriateness in the workplace, rules, and boundaries. And that's something that Michael Scott can't tolerate. We see that he has a relatively strong connection to one of his workers named Dwight. This individual also has boundary problems and insight issues. Dwight encourages Michael when Michael really has bad ideas. So we see kind of the different reactions. Toby sets boundaries. Michael doesn't like that. Dwight has few boundaries, and Michael's attracted to that. We see that he anticipated that he would be successful when he was younger. We see this episode where he tells a group of high school kids that he cannot pay for their college tuition, although he promised to pay for it a decade earlier. So he seems to have moments of caring, even though he kind of misses sometimes with the follow-through. And we see moments of authenticity, like when he looks at Pam's artwork and eventually buys it, right? So there are some caring moments that seem empathetic. Now, moving on to his personality, I'll be using the five-factor model here to assess his personality. The five factors can be remembered through the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, 
and neuroticism, and I'll be doing a facet level analysis. So each of the traits has six facets. So starting with openness to experience, the first facet is fantasy. I think this is one of the easiest to score. It's extremely high for Michael Scott. We see that he has alternate egos, so these personas he takes on. We see various identities during many of the episodes. For example, Michael Scarn, a detective, agent, hero, legend, dance master. This is a character in a screenplay that he wrote. We also see Prison Mike, Michael the Magic, and Date Mike, as well as many other characters. The next facet is aesthetics. Now, this is when somebody appreciates art. So he does seem to have an appreciation for art and creativity, although some of his interpretations would be a bit off or unusual. He sees meaning in things that other people would not see meaning in, and he fails to see meaning where other people would see it. This facet, though, is about the level of appreciation and not about the level of agreement with other raiders. So I think he would be high in aesthetics. In terms of feelings, we see that when somebody's high in feelings, they experience emotions intensely. I think he is high in this facet. He does feel feelings strongly. One of the best examples of this is how he attempts to avoid an emotional goodbye by pretending that he'll be in work the next day, when of course he was leaving that day, right? So he's trying to avoid some of the emotional intensity, maybe some of the pain of those feelings. People high in this facet also tend to be introspective. I think Michael tries to be. I think he believes that he is being introspective. Again, it's the accuracy part that seems to be lacking. Next, moving to actions. I think this one is pretty clear. He's quite high in this facet because he's optimistic and talkative. Looking at ideas, we see here that this is really revolving around intellectual curiosity. I think in some ways he is intellectually curious, but in other ways he believes he kind of knows everything already. So I'd put him mid-range for ideas. The last facet here is values. I would say he is high in this because he is not cautious, right? So he takes a lot of chances. Next, moving to conscientiousness. The first facet here is competence. I would say he's low in this facet because he's ineffective and his capabilities are quite limited. Order is the next facet, again, low because he's disorganized and inaccurate. Moving to dutifulness, this is low. He's not scrupulous. He really doesn't make any effort to avoid wrongdoing. Achievement striving, this one's interesting. He is ambitious, tenacious, and diligent in areas that interest him. He got the job as the regional manager because he was one of the top salespeople in the company. So I think that even though the other facets tend to be lower, I would say for achievement striving, he's probably mid-range or even a little bit above average. For self-discipline, we see this would be low. He's definitely not serious, and he does not follow things through to the end. For deliberation, we see this would be low. He's not thoughtful or careful. He went bankrupt, which is tied to a low score on this facet. Another example here would be his use of the inappropriate line, that's what she said. He says this repeatedly through the series. And we see that one time he even says it when he was just told by a lawyer from corporate to stop saying it, right? So he just has trouble with impulse control. In another episode, he quits his job to start his own paper company without thinking things through. Now moving to extroversion. The first facet here is warmth. I think he's high in warmth. He's very friendly. Next one is gregariousness. I would say very high here. He's extremely outgoing. Assertiveness. He is assertive and confident, maybe a little too confident based on what his actual abilities are. Activity. Activity is high when somebody's always on the go, and I think that's appropriate for him. I think he has high activity. Excitement seeking. Somebody who's high in this facet likes bright lights and noise, a lot of people around them, a lot of stimulation. Michael appears to be this way somewhat, but he seems to be more interested in excitement when he can be the center of attention, like when he planned to jump off a building onto a bounce house, right? So I think he does have some excitement seeking, but again, it's more self-centered. So I would still say he's high in the facet overall. And in terms of positive emotions, he is cheerful. He has a lot of positive emotions, so he would be high in this facet. So moving to the trait of agreeableness, the first facet is trust. 
Now, with this facet, we see kind of an inconsistent presentation. He can be suspicious and cautious, assuming that others may be dangerous to him. But other times, he trusts people way too much. So there's a lot of variation on this facet. So for that reason, I would put this at mid-range. Now, with the next one, we have straightforwardness. This one's also inconsistent. When somebody's straightforward, they don't have a desire to manipulate a story. They just say the story directly. They don't really add anything or try to obscure anything. So I think with Michael, sometimes he does believe he has to change the story around, right? And I think this is tied in, of course, with trust as well, to some extent, maybe even with manipulation. So sometimes he's direct and sincere, and other times he does nothing but dance around the truth. So I would go mid-range on straightforwardness. For altruism, Michael does seem to care about other people, although he does look out for himself as well, but I would still put him as mid-range to high on altruism. For compliance, I think that he enjoys competition more than cooperation. We see this repeatedly throughout the series, so I would put him as low on compliance. With modesty, I think this is one of the clearest facets of any of the facets on agreeableness and really any of the facets on any of the traits. This is low. He has low modesty. He is narcissistic. He blames employees for his mistakes. He believes that he's good at everything, including telling jokes, doing impressions. He pays compliments to himself. He bought himself a mug that says world's best boss, right? Usually that's not a gift you would buy yourself. So again, quite low in modesty. Moving to the last facet here for agreeableness, this is tender mindedness. So this could be thought of as empathy, the ability to understand and react to other people's feelings. This one's a bit tricky. I'll talk more about this one when I get to the diagnostic portion, but overall I would go with mid range to low on tender mindedness. The last trait is neuroticism. So here the first facet is anxiety. We see he's high in anxiety. Next, we see angry hostility. I would say mid-range. He doesn't seem to be particularly angry, but there are moments when he is. With depression, he appears mid to low, but sometimes we've seen moments when it is higher. With self-consciousness, I would say somewhat high, although he doesn't really pick up on social cues very well, so it's not always clear how that self-consciousness would interact with his ability to detect what other people are thinking about him. With impulsiveness, we see here if somebody has high impulsiveness, they have difficulty resisting temptation. That's consistent with his personality, so high on this facet. And with vulnerability, I would say high. He is sensitive to being hurt by other people. So that takes care of personality. Now moving on to mental health. As far as mental health, there are a lot of different theories about his mental health and some controversy. Some people believe he has one or more personality disorders. Usually the area of focus here becomes the cluster B personality disorders, the dramatic erratic cluster. This cluster contains four personality disorders, antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, and histrionic. People have presented arguments for each of these personality disorders as well as comorbid personality disorders. I don't think he actually meets the criteria for any of these four personality disorders, but I have come up with another diagnosis. So let's take a look at these disorders in more detail. I'll explain why I think he doesn't meet the criteria for them. I'll start with the disorders that match the least and move to the ones that are a little bit of a better fit. So starting with borderline personality disorder, we see nine symptoms in the symptom criteria for this disorder. I think an argument can be made for the frantic efforts to avoid abandonment. We see this a few times throughout the series and possibly an argument for the chronic feeling of emptiness. This one is less clear. But as far as the other seven symptoms, I don't see that any of those would be endorsed in the case of Michael Scott. Moving to antisocial personality disorder, we see seven symptoms in the symptom criteria. It seems pretty clear that he does not have this. He technically does meet two of the criteria, impulsivity and consistent irresponsibility. One could make an argument that he is deceitful, uses aliases or cons others, but technically, these behaviors have to be for the purpose of gaining profit or pleasure. So I don't think he really meets that criterion. So three of the seven symptoms are required. So again, we see two endorsed 
and five not endorsed, so no diagnosis here. Now moving on to histrionic personality disorder, we see eight symptom criteria here. So I'll go through each of these. The first one needs to be the center of attention. I think this one is pretty clear. He endorses this one. Second one, interactions with others are often characterized by inappropriate, sexually seductive, or provocative behavior. He certainly does say some things that make it look like he meets this criteria, but I don't think he really does. I think it's really just a poor boundary and a poor filter, trying to be funny, not realizing that he's not funny, not so much about trying to be seductive. Next, we see rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions. So I don't think he meets the rapidly shifting part of this. Some of his emotional expressions seem to be shallow, yes, but I don't think they really shift rapidly. So I would say no for this symptom. Next, we see uses physical appearance to draw attention. Not really. I'm not really seeing this one as connecting with him. There are some examples where he may endorse it, but as a tendency, I don't think so. We see impressionistic speech. I would say this one he would meet. This is when somebody talks in a way where they're giving the impression they understand something, but they don't understand it. The next symptom is an exaggerated expression of emotion. Sometimes I think he exaggerates the emotions, but I don't know if it's really a tendency. Moving on to being suggestible. Some of the time he does seem to be suggestible, but much of the time he really just does his own thing regardless of what other people say. So I would say no with this symptom. And the last symptom considers relationships more intimate than they really are. I think this one is clearly yes, right? So we see three of the eight symptom criteria endorsed. That is not enough for a diagnosis of histrionic personality disorder. The disorder requires five of eight. So this brings me to the personality disorder that is the best match of the 10 personality disorders. And this would be narcissistic personality disorder, NPD. NPD has nine symptom criteria. Five are required for a diagnosis. So looking at the symptoms here, we see a grandiose sense of self-importance. I don't really like this symptom criterion. It's non-specific. It's hard to say if somebody has it or they don't sometimes. So I'm going to say no on this one. Next, we see fantasies of unlimited power success. I usually think of this as more like exaggerated power and success. For the fantasy component, yes, he has fantasies. But is he really looking for a lot of power, success, wealth? I don't think so. I don't think he really meets this criterion. Moving on to feelings of being special or unique. I think this one's pretty clear. He does have this. Requiring excessive admiration. Again, I think this one's clear. He does endorse this symptom criterion. A sense of entitlement. Sometimes he appears to have a sense of entitlement, but I don't think he really rises to the level to meet this criterion. And the same thing I'd say for the next one, being manipulative. Yes, he is manipulative sometimes, but as a tendency, I would say no. Next, moving on to a lack of empathy. This one's a bit tricky. I talked about this when I was going through the five-factor model. I mentioned how this one can be a little complicated. And here's the real problem with his presentation and this symptom criterion. He has high affective empathy. So he expresses a lot of emotions as he attempts to be an empathic responder to other people. But he has low cognitive empathy. He doesn't really seem to understand what people are feeling. We also call this theory of mind. So he has a low level on theory of mind. So this presentation, high affective empathy and low cognitive empathy, is actually inconsistent with narcissism. So here's a place where his character doesn't match up with what we see in real life. However, I have to work with the character I have in front of me, right? So I would say that he does lack empathy. I think he does endorse this particular criterion. He tries to empathize, but he is inaccurate. Next, we see having a tendency to envy other people or believing that other people envy you. I'm a little bit torn on this one. I'm going to say no. There are examples when he envies people and believes that other people are envying him, but I don't think it rises to the level of a tendency. I don't think it's a pattern that is pervasive. The last symptom criterion is being arrogant and pretentious. Sometimes yes, 
but again, as a tenancy, I'm not really sure on this one, so I would say no. So technically, Michael meets three of the nine symptom criteria, which of course is not enough for the diagnosis, but it would be easy to make an argument for fantasy, entitlement, envy, and arrogance. So it's really a tough call. But in the end, I would say no. I would say he does not have NPD. He seems to care about the well-being of others, and he works to help people, even if often he fails when he's doing this. So I think this is actually fairly inconsistent with most presentations of NPD. So does this mean that Michael is not narcissistic? Michael is narcissistic in a grandiose way, not as much in a vulnerable way. It just doesn't rise to the level of the official mental disorder, NPD. So if Michael doesn't have any of the cluster B personality disorders, what would be his diagnosis? Well, he has 10 symptoms endorsed from cluster B personality disorders and impaired functioning some of the time. So I would go with other specified personality disorder with cluster B features, and I would list all 10 of the symptoms that he endorses. Whenever counselors use other specified personality disorder or unspecified personality disorder, they're really relying on clinical judgment. This is not as precise as using one of the standard personality disorders. Michael doesn't have a particularly challenging presentation as compared to most personality disorder presentations. Although he does have that lack of insight I talked about, we don't see some of the other comorbid mental disorders that we often see with personality disorders like substance use disorder or major depressive disorder. Also, much of the time, Michael does function fairly well. Although, as I mentioned, I don't think this part is particularly realistic. If somebody behaved the way that Michael behaves in real life, they would have a lot of difficulties across a number of domains, including in the work environment. Michael's really an interesting character. I think that most people who watched The Office ended up liking Michael Scott. There's an absence of malice there. He wants to be accepted. He wants to be successful. He wants to be a good friend. He frequently has the best intentions, although he often selects the worst behavior to satisfy his intent. So those are my thoughts on the character Michael Scott from The Office. I know whenever I talk about the mental health and personality characteristics of fictional characters, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this analysis to be interesting. Thanks for watching.